I suppose we really ought to start with the meeting of Marcy Carsey and Tom Werner. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right in saying that at that point, 1984, mm -hmm. the American networks were saying comedy is dead. Dead. Tell us how you turned it all around. Dead, you know, good time to join when everybody's dead, <laughs> you know. So, um, I don't know, Marcy and Tom were brilliant and had a great idea, which was to put Bill Cosby on television. Um, what to do, well, there you are, hard to say, but uh, put him on television, base what he had done in his marvelous record career. Yes. Uh, he'd made these comedy records, which are, you know, still to this day, you know, extreme classics. And uh, don't veer too much, just do what he wants. So I met him, and uh, I moved myself, uh, having uh, been, uh, I had a three-year-old and I was pregnant, to uh, New York, uh, where they hadn't produced a television show in 25 years, uh, to Brooklyn, uh, and met him and, you know, just basically said, tell me what you'd like. And I realized smartly, I had one smart image right away, which was very good, and that was, wow, he's an artist, which was different. You know, the, I, how do you treat artists as opposed to how do you treat comics or how do you treat, because he spoke artistically, he spoke elliptically, he spoke like in jazz, yes. and you had to listen with different ears if you're really talking about, and luckily I knew a wee bit about art, and I was able to communicate with him, so the first thing was to just appreciate how he operated and what he really wanted, and then absolutely give him everything he wants. What did he think of you? I think he loves me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so you make a pilot? Yeah, we made a pilot. Um, Over in New York? Actually, the pilot was made in L.A. I see. Uh, with old Madeline sets. It was cute. We had to set old Madeline on the back. We, we were told not to do more than 15 minutes, because that such was the great endorsement and belief of the network, uh, <laughs> that we were not allowed to spend any more money. And which and network was this? That was NBC, but only because, quite famously, ABC, where Marcy had had this honking deal, rejected it. And so in the middle of the night, you know, we ran across the street and uh, NBC accepted it. Marcy, just to put this in perspective, um, back in the day, you'd leave with, if you'd worked at a network, you'd leave with a deal, and especially since she knew where the bodies were buried, you'd, you'd leave with a deal where you were able to get four put series. That's four on the air, 13 times, and, or have to pay them out. So ABC should have kept the Cosby Show. Yes. As a result, when we aired the Cosby Show and it became number one, all of ABC's management was fired. Every one of them, the CEO, everybody gone. And, and their jokes, you know, they never worked again, none of them. And well done. I mean, you know, it's true. How did you pitch this show? I mean, what Cosby, were you just selling? As you would, we were, we're doing a show about a man and his family. Uh, that show is going to look, look and sound a lot like the material that Bill Cosby provided in those records. Yes. Uh, we're not going to veer too far from that. And uh, that's what it's going to be about a man and his family, a contemporary middle-class black man. There weren't too many comedies with black people. No, but then. Bill Cosby was a known commodity. Did they? Th so yes. they, they, he'd had a kind of a dicey decade prior to that, uh, you know, various reasons. And they just didn't like it. They didn't like him. I don't know why they rejected it. But again, you've never heard of their names. They're gone. <laughs> they were... Seriously, they were excommunicated. There's your dumb canned pumpkin, your stupid eggs, and your silly nut. Nut Meg, and thank you. Could you take those wet things off before you catch a cold? Where? There are no eggs in here. There's eggs in there. I put eggs in there. I bought eggs. I don't care what that bag says. There's eggs in there. How quickly was Cosby a hit? Straight up. So you did the pilot. They we did commit? a pilot. It was 15 minutes. We had to expand it with seven more minutes of content. Um, we thought we'd come in a really strong second to Tom Selleck and uh, Magnum P.I. <laughs> what did you suppose at that point this major U.S. hit was going to do for your career? Oh, I was just so happy to be working. Honestly, I, 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 was, I, I didn't have a career in my mind. I had two babies under the age of three, and I had to go to the studio in Brooklyn with one baby like this. I mean, it was... It was overwhelming. And also, working with Bill is a kind of a full-time job, just generally. 
Moving on from Cosby to your next mega, mega hit, which I suppose would be Roseanne. Yes. How did you sell what is a blue collar? Well, who was going to defy Marcy Carcy at that point? Well, I don't know. Tell well, me. Well, no one was because, you know, that show was such a juggernaut that, it, you know, they, they see you coming and they, you know, they're terrified to say no at this point. Plus, remember, it had crossed um, networks. It went from, uh, Cosby went from ABC to NBC and how Roseanne was sold as we went to NBC, they rejected it and we took it over to ABC. This is a continuing pattern in terms of my life. So what was the brief on the Roseanne show? You got Roseanne Barr, you said, would you do a show for us? Or? No, more, more specifically, um, we are always looking, I'm still to this day with uh, my trustee uh, associate, Jamie Glazebrook, always looking for that which is not um, there. So if it's not there, you know, you need to bring it out. And they didn't have a woman lead uh, since Mary Tyler Moore in those days, which ended, I think, in 70-something, 70 78, something like that. So now it's 88, 87. And um, so it's been about 10 years since there was a female lead. There hadn't been any female leads on television. And there were no working class people. So being working class and also female and understanding the, the dire situation of having to raise children and work, we thought other people probably were interested in that subject too. Mm -hmm. And that's what she was talking about, Roseanne. So it was marvelous. So did you imagine that that would become? Nope. <laughs> but we knew right away. We knew, we, actually we knew okay. before it aired. This time we did, we didn't know when we were doing it until we shot it. And then the night that we shot it, we knew we had a hit right away from, from the second line. From the audience reaction? From the audience reaction. The line was, uh, she's making coffee. He comes down the stairs. Uh, uh, he says, is there any coffee? And she says, Dan, every single goddamn day, you're asking if there's any coffee, you know. And he waits and he stares at her and he says, is there any toast? And we got a big laugh on, is there any toast? I mean, big laugh on, is there any toast? I'm trying to get the fly. <laughs> oh, man, it's a big one, too, isn't it? Yeah. Well, maybe we'll just add some raisins. Okay. Um, All right, just throw it away and start a whole new batch. Becky, look! It came out of its hole to forage for food. I hear sometimes you can actually get them to eat right out of your hand. Get the camera. Well, that was so funny. I'm going back to bed. Guess what, Darlene? You're making the fruit salad. Guess what, Becky? You're a big mo. So Roseanne becomes a massive hit. Mm -hmm. You've now had two massive hits. Mm -hmm. You can go into any network you want mm -hmm. and sell practically anything. How did you sell Third Rock? Well, Third Rock had the most twisted and uh, arduous history of all. Third Rock was an idea that we had out of the frustration that we couldn't bear being associated with another, we would call them uh, uh, living room couch comedies, sofa comedies. And uh, so we said, well, we want to do a family show, but they can't be a family. And we kept saying this, we want to do a family show, but they can't be a family. And um, we developed it first with uh, Lily Tomlin and Lily's partner, Jane Wagner. Uh, Jane uh, wrote 150 pages um, for a 30-minute show and uh, put it in a trunk, uh, and it was fabulous. It, had, it, it was sort of like a Peter Beard um, marvelous book, uh, nothing whatsoever to do with the form. And uh, so after a year and a half, we tried to redevelop it again with the brilliant Bonnie and Terry Turner. Uh, by this time, uh, they'd never written a sitcom. They were just sketch writers on, not just, they were good sketch writers, but not head writers on Saturday Night Live, and they were just beginning to write Wayne's World, as I recall. And uh, we pitched it to them, and we said, by this time we had a better vision of it, and we said, they are um, archaeologists from another place, and they're coming here to examine the human condition, and it is odd that we know that we're spinning around, and we know we're going to die, uh, but we still are so brave under those circumstances. So we wanted to do a show much like Star Trek about the human condition not just a, as seen through a family, but the family aspect was less important than observing the human condition in all of its travails. So it was an extraordinary experience developing. It was so much fun. Every second of it was just glorious. How long did it take you to develop? Well, that was another year and a half before we actually shot it. And that was meant to uh, originally um, uh, go to ABC, yes. but ABC rejected it. And so we took it to NBC. In the dead of the night. That was a very that was like a spy operation. How come ABC it? did not understand it. No. ABC said, you know, I don't know how 
you can get p more than 13 stories out of the human condition. <laughs> and so, I said, wow, you must have an incredibly good shrink. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow, so anyway, th they rejected it and we left, run across the street, dead of night. I think that it's fair to say that it was one of the most original, co I mean, was it, it was deeply original. To, was it always it going was, to be It a was comedy? actually, it was always about an English farce in my head. I, by this time, I'd been mooching over here a little bit. I'd been coming here a lot, actually. Well, I, I don't know. remember why. Yeah. I, I don't remember why. It was C the 80s. C I, I have kept going to the Edinburgh Film Festival. And so I was here a lot, and I was deeply influenced by it, for sure. And um, his, he was going to be John Cleese in our mind. Yes. You know, he was, as a matter of fact, ironically, John, ended up, John Cleese ended up playing the big giant head uh, at, at the end of the run. But, um, so where did Lithgow come from? Where had you seen oh, him? Oh, well, you know, he had turned down the role of Frasier. Uh, J John had turned down, well, John had by that point won the Oscar and uh, the Tony. Uh, so he was uh, already God, you know, and he, to this day he is God as actors go. So, so how did you approach just, him? What did oh, you say? Oh, it was a nightmare. Ooh. Tell us. Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, Bonnie and Terry Turner uh, have written a 30 page treatment just trying to explain, not the thing, but just about his character. And somebody, I think it was Bonnie Turner, said to him, and so you'll play an. Alien. I mean, it's just it's so horrible. She had to actually say, you're playing an alien to this great man. And for reasons I'll, I'll always be grateful for and I'll never understand, he said yes. OK, I got it. Here we go. Charlie! Hurry! Charlie! I have terrible news! Just get in the picture. <laughs> I didn't know our camera had a self-timer. What's a self-timer? What sort of runs were you doing for Roseanne and Third Rock? Oh, 25. A year? A year, yeah. And how 23 many, to 25. And how many writers would you be employing? Mm, well, famously, Roseanne had 22 at <laughs> one point. But uh, it was, on an average, I suppose, about 12. And how would you employ them? Would you take them off Roseanne and put them on Third Rock? No, they were all uh, bespoke. You know, you, you have to read them uh, and not uh, writing a, a version of the show uh, like, you don't want to read their spec Third Rock to decide whether or not they could write on Third Rock. So what are you saying, that the scripts came in? We would read people and say, I wonder if that'll be a good Third Rock writer. And you'll read that person and you think, there's something about them, there's something about the way they create their work. It's nothing to do with the show, uh, but just to their humanity, yeah. And so what, you'd invite them in? You know, there'd be, there'd be uh, obviously, you know, this famous team writing thing. Yes. There, there's a head writer. Yes. Um, sometimes the head writers are good at picking other writers. Sometimes they're not. They're just good at managing them. But um, I'd like to think I was pretty good at picking them because a lot of the writers that came off of Third Rock are very successful today. A lot of the writers on every, every one of our shows, actually, um, I'm proud to say, uh, we really spawned, I think, a great many, high percentage of all the working writers today. Your father's always had a soft spot for Stephen, but he loves you too. I just know it. Well, you know what I think? Dad loves Hyde so much, maybe you should marry him. Honey, that's not possible. Your father's already married to me. What? No, Mom, it's, it's an expression. Well, it's not a very good one. 23 skidoo, now that's an expression. Yes. That's what I should have said. The idea came out of a business meeting in which somebody said, we have to appeal to 18 to 49-year-old men, principally. Who, uh, said, who said that? Uh, our business affairs guy, our business guy who sells things says, you can make more money, don't bother with these chicks, seriously. <laughs> they're not going to make you enough money. Girls, no, sorry that they're not fashionable anymore, only men. I kept saying, well, there's no such thing as 18 to 49-year-old men. They don't exist. There are 18-year-old men and there are 49-year-old men. And then I did the math in my head and I thought, wow, how to appeal to 18 and 49. And I literally did the math and my head went, go back to 1976. And that's how the, that 70s shows was created. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't create the show, Bonnie and Terry did, yeah. but I created the idea, yeah. And, and was that an easy, well, I suppose everything it was, was That was my thought. only idea. <laughs> that's the only one I've ever had, honestly. Uh, it's the only idea I've ever had, that was it. So where were you going to Everything get? else is work, work, work. But that was just a flash. And where, where was that going to go? Where were you going to give that? Oh, we knew that was a Fox show because we wanted to have a pot smoking scene. And we knew that that was the, uh, the only network that would let us. So now we have that, the fourth show we've spoken about. 
and Marcy Carsey and Tom Werner and Karen Manderback are probably, <coughs> sparing your blushes, the most successful comedy television producers in the world. I don't know if that's true, but maybe. Um, and then in 2004, you do a strange thing, or at least it seems strange as we sit here now. You decide to up sticks and come to England. Yeah. <laughs> that is strange. <laughs> That's as weird as Third Rock from the Sun. Uh -huh. Why did you do that? Well, business reasons. They didn't want us anymore, uh, us being the independent community, the whole of us. So there are now, to this day, there are no independent um, production companies in the United States that do fiction, period, full stop. So uh, being independent and not able to work for anybody, uh, it, it would seem like a good idea to do, continue doing what I was doing. Um, but at that exact time, the famous window of creative competition had been opened, and a light shone down on me at the Edinburgh Festival, and I thought, well, you know, I'll make a go of it, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so you I, kept, I kept the business going in, in the, the US, though. Yeah. Here we have one of the three world's top comedy producers that has to go to the BBC and sell a show, probably sitting across the desk is somebody that's never made a show in their life. Does this not rather freak them out or indeed freak you out, that you're having to do this. Well, remember my past where everybody rejected us and also, you know, it's their job to be buyers, it's not their job to be sellers. I don't know what it's like to be a buyer. I think you become an instant asshole if you're a buyer. I mean, I, I, don't th I think it just goes with the territory. You don't mean you wake up in the morning, you don't go, oh, I think I'll be an asshole today. But, you know, you are, by definition, it's a shitty job. It's a hard job to do. So I kind of have, have I mean, the guy who said to me, I just don't think there are more than 13 ways to, you know, poor thing, I mean, really. So, so that's a, it's a hard job. And so I, I have sympathy and empathy for them. The, there are things called known as great buyers. They're not unicorns, they do exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, there are amazing buyers, and there are amazing producers, and so you never know. You might be sitting across from one of the amazing ones. And when you were this wonderkin producer in LA, did, what were the, I mean, were you aware of the shows that were going on over here? Always. I had a very serious interest in what was going on here, always. It was sort of, not a hobby, but a, like an avocation. And, and what would you make of what we were doing? In I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. I don't know why. It's like well, music, you know what I mean? You just like certain kinds of music. I really like what the English people were doing from the very beginning, from probably the very beginning. But why do you suppose we feel, now having lived in England for five years, mm -hmm. that we look to America as our template for what's good in comedy? I don't think you do anymore. I think you did, but I don't know that you do anymore. Because we haven't created anything brilliant for a long time. Which brings me on to the fact that how much has television changed, really, in mm. the time that you've been in England? And I mean television... English television or American? Well, let's start with American. Mm -hmm. We don't seem to be getting through that flow of comedy that we used to get. Well, to... sadly, there's less fiction on an American television, period. So the shiny floor shows and the, you know, how to lose weight and be, tell your neighbors you're thin... I don't know, whatever those shows are, I don't watch them, so I, I have no idea. So really, we find ourselves now, as you rather found yourself in 1984 with pre-Cosby. Might even be worse, I don't know, I'm a little worried, but it not, it's well, not hope. there they're saying, then they were saying that the sitcom genre is dead. Mm -hmm. Magnum P.I. is what we are looking for. Right. Do you see a parallel today? I think comedy is never going to die. No. Never, never, never. I mean, any kid who, you know, is just, you know, a kid just wants to make the other kid laugh on the playground, that's it. So that's comedy and cultural comedy is never going away. Character comedy, never going away. Sitcoms, I don't even like the word. I haven't mm. liked the word in years. So what, what do you call them? Character comedies. Character comedies. Mm -hmm. So will they return? I mean, will there be yeah, another Cosby? Definitely. Sure. Definitely. I mean, there'll be, I don't know about, um, I have a big, sad, secretly um, growing fear that television's going to be divided uh, in America between the poor people and the rich people. That the rich people will get really good TV and uh, the poor people won't. I mean it. I seriously fear this. How so? I just think that it'll be subscription models or um, you'll have to pay for the good stuff, otherwise you're going to get a shiny floor show and um, how to lose weight. And... Um do you see that here, or do you think the BBC here is Here you have the ballast there? of the marvelous BBC for which you should be grateful every goddamn day. I think day. we all are. Like you should be. As we are. Um, and, and you working over here, you, 
you're selling to the BBC, yes? Uh, all of them. And do you like being a producer in England? Very much. I love it. How you doing, Peter? You hanging in there? It's all good. No pain? Nope. Can you show me two fingers? Peter, two fingers? Hey, Doc, you should get an iPhone. You think so? Let's get Raj Morto down here. Hey, watch the light, hon. Blood in the ear. Let's check for glucose, rule out CSF, all right? This guy needs a scan. I know what I'm doing. Jesus, bossy. That leg's fucked up. Ortho, seriously? He's got a bleed, I'm telling you right now. He's totally lucid, 100%. Knock, knock. Who's there? See, what I tell you? Let's get some film on that leg. We're gonna fix it real good, Chief. This is actually based on a, um, a goddaughter, my goddaughter, uh, who um, one day she said she was turning 40. And I said, oh, please, you know, that can't be. And she was a nurse, you know, and I, she, she was a funny character. And I asked her how, you know, uh, what she would do if uh, she didn't get caught, you know, and, and wouldn't be put into an insane asylum, how she would behave. And uh, she kept a diary. And, and she's a character whose story needs to be told. And everybody has to be well observed and respected. And none of this old fashioned stuff. I'm talking about now, modern, authentic character comedy. Bring it on. What are your hopes for comedy? over the next five years? Because you're clearly a sage, you know how to do it. Yes, oh <laughs> yes, sure. I love comedy, I just want to see it in any form. I don't think it has to stay in half hours. I think it can bleed into hours. I think the hours could bleed into the half hours. I think characters are important. I think that which is not here needs to be brought out. I think there should be no fear of failure and there should be no fear. I mean, I don't understand. What are we afraid of? We have stories to tell, tell them.